the way this workshop works is the sort of the flavor of it changes quite a bit from one year to the next, depending on who our principal speaker is. But I assure you, it's always interesting. So, um, as I say, keep an eye out for, for announcements, and hopefully, we'll see you in the water next time. Uh, Jerry has a few announcements, but he's going to wait and make those uh, after Andres' uh, talk here this morning. So we will just get right back to work here, and I'll turn things over to uh, Andres, who's going to uh, tell us about not for Molly. Thank you very much. So um, let me start by a very short recap. So. Um, or principal object to try to investigate are not seen as three. And so the way we present it is through a knot diagram. So suppose you have a knot diagram D for K plus there is this marked point on, on the diagram. And as always, my running example is the trap or not. And so, to this object, we associated a set, which I call the set of Kaufman states. Which was a sort of a combinatorial object, because of bijection between crossings and the domains with a certain property. And I also defined two functions on the set of Kaufman states. Um, by describing how it, how the Kaufman state picks up so sort of local coefficients at the crossings. And from this data, uh, we define the Alexander polynomial, which was just a sum for all Kaufman states using these two integer valued functions of the Kaufman state. So having these data, I listed a couple of properties of the Alexander polynomial, and the aim is now to introduce a sort of a categorified version of the same object, and uh, which is called not homology, and it goes as follows. So we keep these objects, and instead of turning them into a polynomial, now I will consider a vector space. Uh, so let's take CFK hat of the diagram to be the vector space freely generated by all the Kaufman states. So I will use F to denote the field of two elements, and uh, kappa will just run through all Kaufman states. So this is a finite dimensional vector space over the field of two elements. And indeed, using these two functions, it's a bigraded finite dimensional vector space. Finite dimensional vector space. The theory has a much fancier version, which I will also introduce now, which is traditionally denoted by CFK minus. And the construction is very similar, except we use this set, uh, the set K, not to be the basis of a new vector space, but a generating set of a new module over the ring of polynomials. So this is just sum of FU which is just the ring of polynomials in the indeterminate U for every uh, generator. And again, I use the bigrading A and M for the generators. And I have to tell you how the bigrading changes when we multiply by U. And so the degree of U, multiplication by U, is just minus 1, minus 2. So this is sort of a funny module, funny gradient module. The homogeneous elements don't form a sub-module over that ring, but we can live with that. We, we can treat it sort of FU to be a graded ring itself by this grading, and then uh, it's a graded homogeneous. So we have these two objects, and then here is the theorem, which I attribute to Peter and Zoltan, and also independently to Jake Rasmussen, and this is from the early 2000s. And so I wrote down the exact uh, formulation I would like to use now. So there is a map D from CFK hat to itself. And D minus from CFK minus to itself. So this is a vector space endomorphism. This is a module endomorphism such that 
and now I will list a few properties. The first and most important is that these maps are like boundary maps in usual homology, so the squares vanish. So this uh, and, let me just uh, write down the, the gradings, so how these maps change gradings, the, the boundary map doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, interact with the first grading, with the A grading, and it drops the M grading I want. <coughs> so uh, this is the first property. The next one is that the, the usual homology, kernel over image, so this is just the homology of the chain complex CFK hat together with this boundary map. And similarly, uh, kernel of D minus over the image of D minus, which is just the homology of this module together with this boundary map. And these gadgets I will denote by HFK hat and HFK minus. So these two objects, the first is a bi-graded vector space, the second is a bi-graded FU module, finite generated FU module, are not invariants. So the way you should interpret this statement is that somehow when we use these Kaufman states and we take this formal sum, then the signs and the exponents are gauged so that the result will be independent of the chosen projection and the chosen mark point. And similarly, if, you, if we pick the boundary maps wisely enough, as these people did, then the resulting homology theory will be independent of the chosen projection and the chosen mark point. <coughs> okay, so before, so the, you know, the, the crux of the the, uh, the theorem is the existence of these two maps. And later on, I might indicate how these maps are defined. This is a long story, involves a lot of interdimensional analysis, and I don't want to dwell into that. I will sort of sketch another flavor of the same theory by defining the boundary map in a combinatorial way, in a simpler way. But before doing that, let me sort of list a few properties of this model of theories. So, of course, the most important theory, the, uh, the, the most important statement is that these are not invariant. And let me add one more uh, property. The rank of HFK minus of K is equal to 1. So, once again, this is a finite dimensional vector space. This is a finitely generated FU module. And saying that its rank is 1, simply means that it looks like fu, a single free part, plus some portion modules, which all look like summation for i. So these are the fu modules, fu torsion parts. And remember, everything is by gradient, so I can attach two numbers each and every cyclic uh, summon by denoting the by gradient of the generator. So here it is like A M M, and here we have A I M I. So this is the bi-grading of the generator. I should remind you the fact, which we learned in school, and I never appreciated the significance back then, that this ring is a principal ideal domain. And principal ideal domains have this very deep property that modules of a principal ideal domain behave by finitely generated Hegelian groups, namely they split as a sum of cyclic summons. And this is exactly the, this is like Frobenius theorem for, for finite uh, Hegelian groups, and this is exactly the split, splitting I was writing down. And the rank one uh, property means that you have a single free uh, sum. Okay, so this is the end of this theorem. So, so is this a fact about the non invariants are a fact about modules over this ring that the, the, the things that you might, the, the, the ideals that you're modding out by are always just generated by a power. Oh, field. I see. So, no, that's not, that, that's not true for every finitely generating module, but this comes from the pi grading. So, somehow, the, the fact that the boundary map drops like this and then the 
the U power, uh, the, the U action has this bike <coughs> immediately implies that uh, the ideals which are generated by a single polynomial should be generated by monomials. And it's what, that's what. So somehow this picture maybe presents this invariant as a less scary object. You just have to record this, I don't know how much tuple of numbers, like what is the by reading of the generator here, how long these torsions are, and what are the generators. So let me give you one more definition. And uh, so whenever you have a finitely generated uh, um, finite dimensional bi-graded vector space, then uh, we can associate its Poincaré polynomial to it, which is just PK of QT. It's we just take the dimensions of HFK hat in grading N and A. So I record the bi-grading one up here and the other one down there. This is sort of the homological grading. It behaves like a homology. And the other one is kept by the boundary map. Times um, Q to the M, T to the A. This is sort of the bi-graded, either the, the bi-graded uh, uh, Poincaré polynomial of, the, of this homology theory. And then, OK, and so let me just give you a a summary of the main properties of these invariants. So the first is, which is sort of a simple consequence, is that if we take the graded Euler characteristics, so we substitute q equals minus 1, then what we get is exactly the Alexander polynomial. So a fancy way to say it is that we have the Alexander polynomial as an invariant of the knot. Now we create a a vector space value invariant, and this is just a categorification of, of this classical invariant in the sense that the graded Euler characteristic, which is just coming from the Poincaré polynomial by substituting q plus minus 1, is exactly what we had before. So you would expect that this is a much finer invariant, and as you will see, it is. So um, we can define gk of t out of this two varietal polynomial by substituting q equals 1 instead of minus 1. And this polynomial now, sort of an upscaled Alexander polynomial, has uh, remarkable properties. So uh, for we have the following properties. The degree of gkt is exactly the cipher genus of the knot. You have to remember last time, or yesterday, I wrote this theorem saying that the degree of the, the Alexander polynomial is a lower bound on the cipher genus. And for alternating knots, it does compute the cipher genus. So now, in this sense, this polynomial is sort of an extension of the same property, but now for everyone. And indeed, the other analogy also holds. So the leading term of this polynomial is equal to plus or minus 1 if and only if k is fiber. So once again, if the knot is fiber, the leading order term of the Alexander polynomial is plus or minus 1. And for an alternating knot, it's an if and only if statement. And gkt is an is an improvement of the Alexander polynomial also in this sense that it actually determines when the knot is fiber. Notice that from this uh, property, it's easy to deduce that GKT is identically 1 if and only if uh, K is the unknown. So one way to say is that this homology theory is an unknot detector. It detects the unknot. It specifies when you are dealing with the unknot. A little remark that it also detects the trefoil knot. The trefoil and the figure eight. It's not very hard to see that it does detect when the knot is fibered, and it also detects the genus. 
and there are only three nodes, which are genus one and fiber, the two trefoils and the figure eight, and then the dimensions and the grading through so telling which one. So it's really a, a worthwhile improvement of the Alexander problem. Okay, so um, as I indicated, the main question is how to define these boundary maps, and I will not tell you the definition in this, uh, in this setting, but we'll sort of switch to the grid word, and so I should remind you about that. Are these G's used to compute for alternating maps? Say so again, oh. Are they used to compute? Yeah, there, is a, there is one more item. So uh, for alternating knots, it's essentially the Alexander polynomial. So PKQT is determined by the signature and the Alexander polynomial for K alternating. I don't know how readable it is, but for alternating knots, you don't get anything new. And I'm not giving you the formula, it's something like uh, I don't really remember, something like this. So it's a very simple formula based on the Alexander polynomial and the signature. So, you know, it's, uh, it's very close to ideal. You know, for, for alternating knots, we were very happy with the Alexander polynomial. And now we get an extension, which is for the uh, alternating knots, does nothing significant, but sort of extends all the good properties for general knots. For general. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so how, how do we uh, define these boundary maps? Well, as I already alluded to, in general, it's, it's, it's sort of a long story, and instead I will, I will stick to this grid picture. So remember that we have an odd k, we can represent it by a grid diagram, and again, I will only draw one single grid diagram. again the trefoil knot. <clears throat> and uh, from the grid diagram we could also reco reconstruct the Alexander polynomial by taking all these corners and putting the t to the binding number there and then taking the determinant. So we will try to sort of use that as a motivation and so this is what we do. The story will be a little more complicated but it is still okay. So step one, uh, number the O markings. So we will have O1, O2, O3, O4, and O5 in this case. You just run, you just randomly number them. And so consider GC minus of the grid by taking the sum. And now instead of taking a one variable polynomial ring, we have n variables, one for each, each O. So we have an n by n grid. In this case, it's n equals five, but in general, it's an n by n grid. We have n variables. And then the generators are these permutations where the permutations themselves represent elements in the sum expanding the determinant. So one such generator can be, re can be represented by a set of circles. Say I take the element here, 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 and say there. Okay, so this is, um, there is one thing I forgot to mention. The top and the bottom are sort of identified and the left and the right is also, are also identified. So we view this diagram not only, not in the plane, but on the torus. So I will indicate it like this. So the, 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 the picture you have to see is like there is this torus inside the standard free space, and then, the, then you have these circles, vertical and horizontal circles, cutting it into little rectangles, and some rectangles are occupied by axis, some by O, and my Yesterday's strategy associates to such a diagram a knot, and every knot arises like this, and now I associate it to it a uh, module over that much more complicated ring. It's a multi-variable polynomial. 
still okay. It's not a PID anymore, so we cannot celebrate its properties as we did before, but it's still okay. Um, it also admits to uh, gradings, and uh, I will not describe uh, the two gradings M and A, not very complicated, but it requires a little bit of a combinatorial hassling. Essentially, M measures how many times do we have a coordinate of, the, of my generator, how many times do I have an interval starting at the coordinate of my generator and ending at an O marking. How many such uh, intervals point to the northeast do we have? So it's not very enlightening, it's a simple combinatorial issue, and likewise A, that comes from these uh, winding numbers. So we have this bi-graded bi uh, module over that ring, and I would like to define the boundary map. So I will sort of not worry about the hat version as I did before. We concentrate only on this minus, and so here is the definition. So we would like to have a map of this type. And the definition is as follows. So um, it will be a module map, so I only have to specify it on, on generators. So this is a generator sigma of GC minus. And this will be a sum for all other generators tau. And then we will count some gadgets, which I will explain in a second, some rectangles. Um, okay, so this is a permutation where you can visualize it through a graph. Tau is another permutation, and we only consider those taus where the two permutations differ in a transposition. So sigma and tau should differ by a transposition. In pictorial language, it just means that uh, the two graphs should coincide everywhere except in two spots. So for example, a good Y would be something like this. You see, they, they coincide everywhere except there are two spots where they sort of flip position. <laughs> once you have that, once you have such a tau, I should explain what this coefficient is. Well, if you have four points in this position, they determine four rectangles. That is one. <coughs> there is another one which sort of goes around. There is a third one like here. Remember, we are working over the torus. And that is the fourth here. Can you see that? So the torus is cut into four rectangles. We will declare two to go from the yellow to the blue by deciding how the arcs are moving in the horizontal edges. So this one goes from yellow to blue, and this big one goes from yellow to blue. The other two goes to, from blue to, red, to yellow. So we take all these rectangles going from sigma to tau, and we pose two restrictions. The first is that no other coordinate should be in this rectangle, so no other yellow or blue, and no axis. So our intersection with um, sigma should be empty, and our intersection with all the axes should be empty for all the x margins. So for example, this is an absolutely fine rectangle, uh, but this is not because it does contain other coordinates. So, it's sort of a technical definition, but, uh, but it does work. And so I will just try to prove two statements for this. So um, lemma, the square is 0, and uh, multiplication. by vi and by vj 
are chain homotopy. You know, this is sort of an important property because on the nose, the module itself depends on the size of the grid, and that's bad news. We would like to get something which only depends on the knot, but of course the chosen size of the grid is a, is a choice, but it seems like it does not really, although originally it is defined over this much richer ring, but the individual uh, indeterminants act in the same way in all. This is exactly what it means that they are chain homotopic, so on homology when you take multiplication with them, they are absolutely Okay, so let me try to prove the first statement. So how does that go? So what we have to do is we just pick one generator, which I will symbolize by these yellow circles. So sigma will be symbolized by yellow. And we take a rectangle, R, which takes it into tau. How, does, how can that happen? Well, there is a rectangle somewhere in my grid which starts at yellow and goes to blue and at all the other uh, horizontal and vertical lines both yellow and blue has one coordinate and the other. Right? It's like in expanding a determinant. And then we just take another rectangle and now I'm running out of Greek letters. So shall we take new? So it goes to a third generator new. Okay, so how can that happen? Whenever you take a rectangle, you know that all the coordinates stay put except two moves. So we have to distinguish three cases. This R has two moving coordinates and this guy has two moving coordinates. It might happen that they are completely disjoint. They have one common moving coordinate or both of the moving coordinates are the same. And I will just address the first two. The third will not appear. So. In the first case, when they have completely disjoint moving coordinates, this is the case. So we traveled with R1 from yellow to blue, and we take R2, which take us from, sorry, from yellow to blue. So we go from blue to green. So we have this. Uh, but we would like to say that the component of sigma, when we apply the boundary map twice, the new component of sigma is zero. So although we have one weight from, for going from here to there, we would like to find another one which sort of will cancel each other. And indeed it exists because we have to remember that all the coordinates of blue and yellow are the same. So these are two other coordinates. So um, we can start with that rectangle, this will be my R1 in an alternate way. And so I will try to use another color. So there is this red uh, uh, um, generator, which is the same as yellow outside of the outside of this space. So this is like this. And so we can take this to be R2, going to here, and R2 to there. So I don't know how visible this is, but what, what I did is first I apply the rectangle and another one, and it has a companion where first I apply this guy and then that one, and it fits into, a, into such a rectangle by starting with sigma, going in two alternate way, ending up at the same point. In, in the sum, they will sort of cancel each other and we will get that equation. Does that make sense? I have the feeling that I'm sort of Why lost. do they cancel? Say it again? Why do they cancel the whole time? Well, no. So there is this good old gauge theory trick where you don't know how to handle signs then you move it over <laughs> Actually, we do know how to handle slide signs, but it's very complicated. So I don't want to go into that. So the whole theory extends over C, but so far it didn't produce any good, any additional information. But, uh, but you are absolutely right. You know, there, there is a good way to sprinkle the whole theory with signs, and I will not do that. 
And indeed, this is kind of the idea of like seeing how things split in different ways to prove, to finish the proof of this statement and then every, and then the fact that all the VIs and VJs are chain homotopy. And in fact, this is the driving idea of showing that the resulting uh, homology is an up invariant. I will not go through that. It will require a lot of similar pictures and uh, maybe that would be just uh, driving us apart. But uh, instead, uh, let me show you how to apply this, this theory. So uh, <coughs> recall G, C, G, the homology of G, C, G boundary, which I do by G, H. K is a vibrated FU module of rank 1. So, as I already wrote down, this looks like a free module in some vibrating plus some torsion part. So, it's very easy to extract the numerical invariant out of this picture, namely, we take one of these radians. <laughs> And we declare the tau invariant of the dot to be the A grading of the generator of the free part. For historic reasons, we have to put a minus sign there, but it doesn't make a difference. So um, it turns out that this is a very important not invariant. And so I will just invoke a theorem. And I will sort of indicate how to prove that theorem. So um, this invariant can be computed for the PQ torus knot, and it happens to be equal to one half P minus one times Q minus one. This is the number you had met yesterday. In this, plug. this is the the conjectured slice genus or four-ball genus of this torus knot. And so indeed, the next inequality tells you. that in absolute value, this is always less than the four genus of the knot. So, um, so by combining these two properties, in fact, you get the proof of Miller's conjecture. Once again, this was proved by Kronheim and Rovka in 1993 using the uh, donaldson Hitch theory. And the same statement has a very neat proof using Kovanov homology. And this proof is another sort of combinatorial based, avoiding a complicated analysis type of proof. So how can we prove these two statements? So I will spend a little time on that and a little more on this. Um, so the first one requires a, so let, let me just give numbers to that. So one and two, so one. This is, a very, this is an explicit calculation. And for the explicit calculation, we need a grid diagram of the PQ torus knot, which will be just a generalization of the, of the grid diagram of the trefoil. It's sort of easy to describe. You have an n by n grid where n is now p plus q. You put the O's in the main di diagonal, and then you put an x on the p slot. And then you put all these axes here. And you start with the P plus first. And you put the remaining axes there. So this is a, an absolutely fine grid diagram. And I claim that this will be the PQ force knot. I mean, you know, you can convince yourself by sitting down and drawing that. I hope it will work out. It did work out in the past. <laughs> it's German technology. <laughs> so I would like to get one one element in this uh, in this uh, module. So I should uh, specify a permutation or a system of these yellow or uh, blue dots. And indeed, there is one very convenient one, namely. Whenever you see an x in a square, you just put you just put a dot on the upper right corner. 
all the way up, except the top is identified with the bottom, so it comes down here, and then it goes all the way up, again it's identified with that one. So we get a blue circle is a specific generator, of g c minus of g and there are a few little statements so the first is that indeed blue is a cycle so it's not only a generator but it will be a significant member of the homology indeed blue generates Um, the, the free part. So it's not only non-zero in homology, but actually you will get a generator of the free part. And notice that the tau invariant is exactly one of the grading of the generator of the free part. And then the, the degree of blue is equal to what we want to see. I didn't define how to compute the gradient, so this is sort of completely, you know, in the cloud. The two others actually can be proved pretty easily, and I will not do that, but it's sort of a little playing around with the rectangles, like what rectangles go out and what rectangles come in, by which I mean that this rectangle goes out of yellow and goes into blue. We need both, right? There should be no rectangle going out because we would like to have a cycle, but we also would like to have a non-zero cycle, so it shouldn't be at the boundary of anything. And indeed, we require much more. It has to generate the free sum. It requires a little bit of playing around with the, with the diagram, but it's not very complicated. So let me sort of switch to, to this uh, statement. And again, I will just give you an idea of how it works. In the abstract, I promised the proof of Milner's conjecture. So that was like, uh, you know, I don't consider to be myself to be young, but sometimes I act like youngish and, you know, <laughs> completely <laughs> unjustified optimism that it's easy and this stuff. It looks sort of easy, but you have to work out the details and so, now I, you know, in retrospect, I changed my abstract. <laughs> and I try to give you a feel how this proof goes. Okay, so you define this chain complex, you specify, you go through the invariance, you specify one single guy, and compute the grading, and all you are left with is this inequality. And that should hold for every number. The reason I would like to bring up this inequality is that somehow it, it is very close to the whole philosophy of this approach. We had the Alexander polynomial and we replaced it by vector spaces. Like we do in usual simplicial homology, we have the Euler characteristic and we replace it by simplicial or singular homology. We don't do it because we get more numbers, vector numbers, which replace, which refines the Euler characteristic. Or we don't do it only because of that. The reason we would like to do it because we get uh, homomorphisms induced by maps. So this is the true meaning of like category finding a theory, not only replacing it by vector spaces, but somehow we get relations between those vector spaces. And this is exactly how the proof of this statement goes, so this is why I would like to give an idea of how it works. Um, if I find it here. Um, So, um, so suppose uh, we have two knots, K0 and K1, and this is S3 cross 0, 1. So this is S3 cross 0, and this is S3 cross 1. And there is a cobordism between them. W so this uh, inequality 
will follow easily once we can convince ourselves that the change of tau is less than uh, the genus of this cohort, right? Because, I mean, this uh, number is nothing else than the minimal genus of a cohortism from your naught to the unknown. And for the unknown, one has to do a little calculation which will turn out to, to have tau equals zero. So this, this is the real inequality we would like to prove. What I stated here is merely a special case of that. Does that make sense? Okay, so we would like to work with cobordisms and sort of we hope that such a cobordism will induce a map between the, the homology groups of K0 and the homology groups of K1 and we will be so lucky that it will sort of respect this splitting and we also get a control on how the gradings change and you know, it's like daydreaming but in, in fact it will work out in some extent. So let me just show you how. So the first step is that W admits a normal form. What is it? So whenever you have a cobordism, you can sort of project it down to 0, 1. This is a surface, so it will have various critical points, index 0, index 1, index 2. And when so for a generic embedding, it will be a Morse function, and you would like to run the usual Morse theory argument. And when you do it for manifolds, the first step is to take a self-indexing Morse function. And it's not a very deep theorem, and also it is contained in Mionor's book, so you just quote it. Here it's a little more sophisticated, because you are not free to play around with the function. The function is given, the projection is given. You can sort of wiggle a little bit the the embedding. And the question is, can you wiggle it so that it will that the projection will be a self indexing Morse function? And the answer is yes. So this is what normal form means, that you can isotope the surface until all the index zero critical points come first, then index one and index two. So I will produce a new picture which sort of supposed to uh, indicate that. So we have a couple of index 0 critical points and a few index 2 and in the middle we have some index 1. So the first step is that you can do that. It's not very hard to push down the index 0 and push up the index 2 to get the index 1s at the same level that requires a little bit of effort. Okay, so we are done with that. So step 2, we cut our cobordism into three pieces. So first, I cut somewhere here and somewhere there, and I will call it k0 prime and k1 prime, with the property that k0 prime is nothing else than k0 union d1 naught union d1 handles uh, or band. What this step makes is that. First, you pass all the one, hand, all the zero handles, so you will have a disjoint union of your knot and a couple of our knots, and then you start collecting them together, and you can take a slice where you add those one handles, which make it a connected knot. And similarly, k one prime is k one union b on knots union b band. So again, one has to think a little bit by this usual Morse theory, and then we start the proof. So we have W0, W1, and W2, three sub -cobordisms. One going from K0 to K0 prime, then from K0 prime to K1 prime, and from K1 prime to K1. This has this very specific description, the upper one has a very specific description, and in between we only have one handle. So it's sort of nice. And then here are the two facts. Fact one, the tau of k0 is the same as, as the prime, and likewise. But the proof of this statement is sort of longish, and it requires the same kind of technology as the stabilization invariant. So I will not say a word about that. I was planning to, but I'm not doing that. And fact number two is that 
Now we have this, this intermediate organism, and we would like to say that the change of tau here has something to do with the genes. And so, um, maybe I will write that down here. Um, suppose that a cobordism um, W prime between K zero and K between K prime and K double prime consists of a single band. So we would like to sort of chop off this cobordism into single band attachments. Then the claim is that the tau changes by at most one. So this is what we would need. Of course, it would give a, a number, a, a multiplicative factor of two here. So we have to refine it a little bit. And let me point out one other subtlety that whenever you have a knot and you have a band, but you get is a two component link out there. So you have to sort of extend the whole theory to links, and I will not do that. You can pretend that these are not. What you really would like to see is how to get a map induced by this W prime. And this is what I would like to tell you. So we will define a map from GH minus of K prime to GH minus of K double prime, and we hope that the free part will go to the free part. We will have a control on the, on the uh, change of the vibrating, and then this will be an easy consequence. And again, I didn't define the vibrating, so I will not mess with that. And I will just tell you how to define such a map. But in order to define the map, we sort of have to see the band attachment in the grid. <laughs> So this is where geometry comes back a little bit. And we can represent the, the band attachment, this single band, by a moving degree. So how can we do that? So I prepared a little diagram for that. So here it is. So su suppose we have a knot, K prime, represented by this grid G, which is a huge grid, and I will just indicate a little portion of that. Okay, and then there, there is a lot of other stuff around and I will never touch those. So this portion of the grid require, uh, defines portion of the knot which looks like this. Right? The rule is that you connect from X to O and then it just goes out. And now I claim that when I would like to attach a band here, the band attachment can be prescribed by the following move on the grid. We just take the following grid, which is exactly the same outside as was before, and the axis stayed put, but I switched the role of the O's. Okay, so attaching a band does, is nothing else than you just take these O's and sort of put it in this opposite position. And if you draw the corresponding uh, link, then what do you get? This is what you get. And I hope it worked out fine, although it looks a little different in my drawing. So I'm a little worried. Because I made a mistake. Okay. So this is how it looks. Say it again. Um, and so when, when you attach this band, then the new knot will look like this. And this is exactly what you see there. So it works out fine. And all I have to do is to sort of take this change, so this is my k double prime corresponding to g prime, and set up a map between the two chain complexes. 
And this is what I will do. And the math will be very simple. So I will just copy it right here. Um, So I will define a map sigma which goes from C G G to G C G prime and the mu which comes back and so this is my this is the sigma map. You take a, a generator X and you multiply either with X with U or just leave it like this, and this is a, if there is a coordinate between the O's, and the other map is just the converse, if there is a coordinate between the O's. So let me explain it a little more. So, um, when you take a generator, every generator has a coordinate in every horizontal and every vertical. There are the guys which have a coordinate just between the O's, and there are the others which don't, which have something here. The claim is that this map, sigma, which just multiplies the first guy, which just keeps the first type of guys intact and multiplies the others, is a chain map between these two chain complexes, and likewise mu, which goes from this direction to that is also a chain, chain map. Clearly, if you compose them, you get multiplication by u globally. This is a map which takes free part to free part. You have to check what the, the grading shift is, and that will sort of justify that statement. And this will actually prove the inequality, which at the end will prove the whole random tau. So, in a nutshell, it was a long story. It was a confusing and very long story. The two lessons we should learn from that. Three. It's like the Spanish Inquisition. So the first is that the, the grid approach gives you a way to describe everything in a sort of combinatorial planar geometric manner. The second is that uh, many moves you apply on knots and links can be presented by moves on the grid. Like attaching a band is just flipping the position of two O's. And, uh, the, and the last one is that complicated looking maps in this picture can be described in a very simple manner and then it requires a little bit of a thing or of a computation to see how the brain has changed. And this will lead to these applications I was mentioning. So um, so this is like what I wanted to tell you about grid diagrams and tomorrow I will do something a little bit different and we will get back to this half state picture and see what we can do. generators do we have? If you have an n by n grid, then we have a generator for every permutation, n factorial. This is the, the sign computer scientists don't want to see. <laughs> so the trefoil is a 5 by 5. So there you have 120 generators. The homology will be three-dimensional. So, you know, it's a, I always say this, uh, this analogy. So um, this is like this, this theory is like good old rotary phones. It's like huge, very simple. Your father can explain how it works when you are 10 years old. Hagar thermology is like iPhones. <laughs> like nobody understands. I'm, I'm completely sure that like nobody understands how they work. Very compact, very nice, but, uh, but this is very hard to program. So they, people don't do that. I mean, for, for low processing not, there are programs which don't do it like brute force like I define. They use some kind of symmetries and tricks. But there is a program of, of Peter and Zoltan where they would like to make the Hegel version combinatorial. It requires more algebra, but it's okay. 
So I will talk about that tomorrow. But, so maybe the answer to this question was contained in the answer to the last question. But um, not, notwithstanding the, the nice invariants that come out of this, you know, the definition of these chain complexes and, and the boundary maps all seems uh, you know, a little out of the blue. You, you, know, you take these Kaufman states and you manipulate dots. And, you know, what was the motivation for you know, finding these formulas that would work and, and that they would lead to something nice? Yeah, so I hope I will answer that tomorrow. Maybe no. we'll see. But <laughs> so what happens is that there is this, um, there is this homomorphic uh, Lagrangian Fleur homology approach, which I tried to picture as like super complicated, and I did a good job. But so the motivation there is sort of clear, and it's a very long chain of, of, of theories and drum of compactness and uh, the theory drum of it invariance. You know, there is a lot of work in that. Now, if you take a very specific case and you take these grid diagrams as geometric objects and you run the same holomorphic program, this is what you get. And then, you know, elegant as it is, and what people do in mathematics in many cases, you know, there is a very complicated and narrow road to get to an idea. And then you just throw away the road and you just present the idea at the end. And then it's very clean, you can explain it, and it doesn't take very long to prove theorems. And of course, then you would sit and say, like, how the hell did they come up with that idea? And then, you know, <laughs> work, I guess. So I should add some names, maybe. So this whole grid approach is pioneered by Chikyan Manolescu, uh, uh, Suchurit, uh, Peter Ojvar, and Suchurit Sarka. And the the completely combinatorial approach was done by Manolescu, Oshvar, Sabu, and Thurston. And now, as you asked, let me add one more thing. We wrote a book about this like three years ago, and the title, so let me just take a commercial break here. <laughs> so the, the, the title of the book is Grid Homology for knots and links. It's a sort of a longish book. It's like 400 pages. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I should point out that the first like 130, 140 pages contains all these introductory material together with the Milner's conjecture. So this is sort of, the plan was to get a, a, a small booklet which is good for a semester worth of lectures, but then <laughs> but um, these are the sources which can be useful if you sort of think that it's interesting. Programming, I say no. But there are other ways to, to, to do such computations, and tomorrow I hope to get to that. Other questions? Okay, so let, let's thank Anders first.